Oh, good morning, Woo! ladies. Good morning, Hello, bro. Come on, come on. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to Leanne for that incredible morning. lesson. Thank you um, for being so vulnerable and sharing us with your heart, letting us see your heart. I know I was moved, I was inspired, and I know all the women are here too. So thank you again, Leanne. Uh, I am so excited for this winter workshop and to be with you all this morning. I don't know if you know this about me, but I love the women's ministry. It fires me up. It makes me excited. It helps me get out of bed in the morning, and I just love it. And I'm excited uh, to see the way God is going to use you and the way he's going to use me this year. Um, I've been given the title of Faith That Pleases God. So for the sake of time, we're going to go to Hebrews 11.6, but I'm just going to read it. It says, many of you might know this scripture. You might have it even memorized. It says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You know, this passage to me is convicting and encouraging at the same time because there's a challenge and there's a promise. The challenge is that we have to have faith that pleases our Lord our father, and then there's a promise, is that he will reward us if we earnestly seek him. You know, as many of you heard last night, RD share about my many health struggles, um, <clears throat> you know, this thorn that God has given me requires me to have great faith every single day. Um, and I wake up every single day with a deep desire to hear God say, well done, my good and faithful daughter. That's all I want. You know, and circumstances often happen to me that force me to grow my faith so that I can please God. You know, not only in the past where I've made decisions to go out on the mission field or do things that are faithful, but every single day until the day that he calls me home. So my first quick point is going to be God wants us to use our faith. Okay, and um, just a quick story for illustration purposes. Uh, back in October, me and some of my roommates went on a hike. Um, I got dehydrated. It was a really hard hike. Shouldn't have went, but I did. Um, I ended up having a really, really um, crazy fast rhythm that, that was probably life-threatening. And I got shocked, and I ended up in the ER um, at UCLA. That's where I always go. So because of COVID, no one can come there. I was by myself for three days in the ER and I was off to the side while they were waiting to get me a room in the cardiac floor because they want to monitor me and make sure that my body is ready to go and go again. So, but they only can give me a room when there's rooms available. So I'm in the ER three days, couldn't shower, couldn't really sleep. The bed was uncomfortable. There was so much noise. And on top of it, I started my menstrual cycle. So I was miserable. Um, and I remember begging God. I was like, God, I need to get out of here. Like, I feel like I'm going to lose my mind. Like I, I was ready to check myself out. I was just, I just couldn't do it anymore. And so I remember praying. I said, God, please give me a room on the cardiac floor within four hours. And it was 12. And I was like, oh my gosh. Okay. That was, that was intense. I was like, okay, I'm just, I can't doubt this is going to happen. God has my back. I know it. I know it. So I fell asleep because I was exhausted. And literally like at 3.15, the nurse wakes me up and she's like, you have a room. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like I, it was huge. Like it was huge. I know it doesn't sound huge to you, but to me it was huge because I put myself out there. I said, God, please come through. And he did. And I know cognitively that God watches over me. I know that. I, I know every day he cares for me. He gives me great doctors and medicine. But this was the first time I actually stepped out there and said, do this specific thing for me. And you know what? I'm so glad I did because it confirmed my faith. It rewarded me. It, and I, it was lifted to a new level. It massively increased my faith and it encouraged me. And it literally just reinforced and anchored my soul in his love. And it, it, it was so encouraging for me. And I know uh, so this morning, ladies, I want you to step out on your faith. Ask God for that one thing that's heavy on your heart, that one thing that nags at you, that you cannot stop thinking about, that you know is going to require God to come through for you. Because faith is not just saying, oh, yeah, I believe in God and he's going to meet my daily needs. 
but it's those things that you need the extra encouragement for. And that's what will truly please God. When you rely on him for everything in your life, not just the big things, but every little thing, God will come through for you. And that's the way that we will please God. Thank you for letting me share. Come on, April. Come on, April. Well, good morning, Hi. ladies. My name is Jesse Rojo. I have the honor and privilege of talking about faith to be pure and righteous. In Matthew 5, verses 29 through 30, I'll go ahead and read that for us. It says, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown in hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. This is an intense scripture, I'll tell you that. And I think, you know, I, I was never really convicted by this scripture in the world. I see here Jesus was really literal about cutting off his hand. And if, if, our, sin, if our sin causes us to stumble, if our hand causes us to stumble, just cut it off. Right. And what's interesting, though, is it's not our hands that cause us to sin. It's our hearts. And I know for me, this hasn't always been my conviction when it comes to purity and righteousness. I was as worldly as they come. Um, I just want to share some of my sin with you from the world. I, I was impure with men before I was a disciple. I was sexually immoral with two of my boyfriends in high school. I was into pornography and masturbation. I went to festivals, I went to parties, and I actually also abused substances. I was totally enslaved to the impurity and worldliness, and it was not pretty. And I think for me, all of these sins in my life that I talked about, they really became extensions of the deep impurity that was in my heart. Now, the definition of purity is really encouraging. It's freedom from contamination. And the meaning of righteousness is being right with God. And so I think for us ladies to obtain purity and righteousness in 2021, we got to stay free from contamination of the world and we got to stay right with God. And after gaining this conviction of just wanting to have a clean slate, wanting to be right with God and having a pure heart, I became a disciple of Jesus. And since then, God has done miracles in my life. He's allowed me to be sober from all substances for over four years, to completely abstain from masturbation and pornography for four years, and to have a totally pure dating relationship and engagement where now I get to marry a true man of God. And I really don't deserve any of these things, but I think that God really does feel glorified when we fight to be pure and we fight to be righteous for him. And you might be asking me, well, sis, how do I maintain purity and righteousness? Well, sis, <laughs> here are some things that some of the women in my life really passed on to me and taught me that I want to pass on to you today. So I'm going to, I'm going to go off just four quick scriptures, three, three quick scriptures for the sake of time. I'll read them. So the first one is Psalm 51, verse 10. And the scripture reads, Create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. And I love this scripture, God create in me a pure heart. There's got to be a longing and a prayer for a pureness of heart. I really want to lift up Lizbeth Cohen. She showed me this scripture when she was discipling me in the South region. And ever since, it's really helped my heart. I, I do believe that impurity is the matter of the heart. So heart, heart impurity can be bitterness, envy, selfish ambition, malice, jealousy, dissension, resent, resentment, all of these things are impurity. And for us ladies, my challenge is to pray every single day this prayer. God, please create in me a pure heart today. Please keep my heart pure for you. My second scripture is in Proverbs 26, 11, And it says, as a dog returns to its vomit, so fools repeat their folly. And no one, no one likes dog vomit. That's yucky, right? But True repentance is what's going to keep us pure and righteous. So I feel that we got to hate our sin as almost as much we would hate the idea of eating vomit. <laughs> we got to hate going back to that impurity and unrighteousness. So true repentance will really bring us a pure heart. And my last scripture is in 1 John 1 verse 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just 
and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Openness is a key. Guys, we got to spill our guts. I believe that the close friendships in our lives are our lifelines, and they'll help us to know when we're getting on a path of impurity or unrighteousness. So my encouragement is to make sure we're confessing every day any impure thoughts, impure heart motives, anything like that to our close friends, to our disciples. That way we can be purified of all unrighteousness every day. And ladies, I think that if God can help me in this area, he can definitely help you in 2021. This year, let's be women that are pure and that are righteous for God. Thanks for letting me share. Come on, Jesse. Come on, Jesse. Well, good morning, sisters. Um, the title of my short charge today is Faith for Sisterly Love in Our Discipling Relationships. And uh, one of the greatest things that God has given us in the kingdom obviously besides our salvation is our relationships you know but they're one of the things that can take the most work and um you know in second our main scripture today is uh second corinthians 6 verses 11 through 13 and it reads uh we have spoken freely to you corinthians and open wide our hearts to you we are not withholding our affection from you but you are withholding yours from our from us as a fair exchange, I speak as to my children, open wide your hearts also. And I love this scripture uh, because we get to see the hearts of Paul and Timothy and the examples that uh, they set in giving their whole hearts to the relationships. Um, and Paul here was calling the church in Corinth to do the same. And I just want to highlight or pinpoint this uh, specific word here in exchange. It means an act of giving one thing and receiving another spe uh, specific especially of some type of value or return. And God wants us to do this with our hearts for uh, our relationships to not just be one-sided and to not have a mindset of just taking, but that we're also giving as well. And you may be asking, well, what can I give? <laughs> you know, we can give our whole hearts. We can give our love, our loyalty, our support, our encouragement, our friendships, and so, so much. You know, and obviously there are roles in our discipling relationships, uh, but we're still sisters and partners in the gospel. And God expects us to have a love and a unity in our relationships. And I just want to share uh, two key virtues that I believe can strengthen and deepen our discipling relationships as we open wide our hearts to one another. And the first one is faith, and the second one is humility. And the first one for faith, um, and you can just write this down for reference in Luke ch uh, chapter 17, verses 3 to 5. Uh, here we see Jesus teaching his disciples about the type of relationships they should have with each other and teaching them to forgive one another. And the apostles exclaimed, Lord, increase our faith, <laughs> right? And inevitably we will um, make mistakes and it will take great faith to continue to give our hearts to one another. Uh, we are to have faith and take great comfort in the fact that God is sovereign and he placed specific people in our lives, especially our discipling partners, whether you're a discipler or a disciplee. Um, it takes great faith in God to entrust ourselves to other people. Uh, we have to remember that Satan's mission is to steal, kill, and destroy. And one of the main ways he does this is by getting a foothold in our relationships. So let's, uh, so sisters, let's fight to protect our relationships with great faith. And number two is humility. Um, and you can write this down for reference in Mark chapter 1, verse 7 through 9. Here we see Jesus and John's humility in their relationship. Uh, their relationship was all about advancing God's kingdom and not about what they could out get out of it individually. Uh, the result was that they both baptized, they spoke highly of one another, and they honored one another out of love for God and each other. Um, and I believe God gives us discipling relationships to teach us to open wide our hearts also and teach us important lessons that we would never be able to learn on our own. Um, and I'm so grateful for the privilege I get to be in discipling relationships with many women. Um, and I just want to specifically lift up uh, Burgundy, Yanakea, and Sonia Gonzalez. You know, they're incredible examples of these characteristics in, their, in these relationships. They're women of great faith and humility. 
they have faithfully entrusted themselves to me and they're more they're mature <laughs> they've been married for longer raised kids they've been disciples for longer they have more life experience than i do yet they trust god in our relationship and they give their whole whole hearts and it makes the uh, just i'm so grateful um we have a beautiful relationship and in closing i just want to encourage all of us to examine our relationships and see in which ways we can grow in our faith and our humility with one another uh, when we keep great faith and humility in our relationships, we will keep a sincere sisterly love and we will le uh, learn from each other and protect one another from Satan's schemes. Um, and as we grow in our relationships, we will see God move mountains in our personal lives and in our ministries as well. Well, I love you ladies very much. All right, ladies, good morning. I have the privilege to be able to preach about faith to love your households. Now, I'm going to go over two different, my name is Mariah Lashker, by the way, and I have had the honor to live in two sisters' households before I now am married and living with my amazing husband. And I just want to go over two examples of women in the Bible that I think of that had great faith and loved their households. Now, of course, for the sake of time, I'm going to quickly go to these scriptures and just read them. Okay, so just write them down for reference. I'm going to be in Acts 12, verse 5, and it says, So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. And as if you guys have read this passage before, you know that an angel helps Peter break out of prison. And although at the moment, Peter just couldn't, like he thought he was in a dream. But back to verse 12, it says, When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed. She ran back without opening it and explained, Peter's at the door. So this was one of the first century churches, as we noticed in the kingdom study in Acts 1, when they're in the upper room, all the disciples together and the apostles. So John Mark's mother, we know that she's in good financial standing. She, it's evident because she has a servant named Rhoda. And also she has space to hold the apostles and disciples in her home. She even has an, up, an upper level of her housing. And it was constantly a place that Peter could confidently go to to reach out encourage disciples and spread the good news and the miracles of God so is this how your household is known for is this something that people can look to and be like I can totally go to this sister's household and be able to be welcomed have great fellowship or do a great bible study right my next woman from the bible is Simon Peter's mother-in-law so after, so just a quick summary, after being healed from her fever that was going to kill her, she immediately began serving Jesus and the rest of the people in the house because she was so grateful for her life. She was so grateful to be saved by Jesus. And is this something that we can reflect on? Do you serve with gratitude? Are you happy and grateful to serve thanks to your salvation as a disciple in your home? So a few great examples of women I think of um, that have great faith and, and love in their homes is Therese Antelon, Sharon Kirshner, and Liz Cohen. I love them so much. They're so warm with their love. When uh, you come over, they're generous, they're neat and organized. And so now I'm gonna jump to a few scriptures to look at in 1 Timothy 5 verse eight, it says, anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Ooh, that's a spicy scripture. It's super cutting because we got to remember like, wow, is this something I'm willing to do for my sisters, for, for visitors, right? And I know we're in COVID, amen. So this, this is taken with a grain of salt, but one thing I want to challenge the sisters to implement is to come up with a budget within your household to accommodate and encourage company for your home, such as coffee, tea, crackers and cheese, charcuterie, um, snacks of any kind, just making sure you have something. Um, and of course, like perhaps like a blow up mattress or extra blankets and a comfortable carpet. Amen. So if there is a need, 
to connect and help someone feel loved and listened to in your household, such as a guest visiting or your roommate, have the heart to stay up and have tea together. And of course, most of all, pray together. Amen. My next scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This should be a motto for every single one of us sisters that I love my sister more by the way I treat her in truth and love. Train, correct, rebuke, right? And it would it takes great humility to get that to get that discipling in our life, in our homes, because our life at home is our discipleship. That is our realest, rawest form of who we are as disciples is our life at home. Amen. So I know I personally grew so much as soon as I lived with sisters in a sister's household. It honestly pre prepared me to be a wife and to be able to share a home with my husband now. So it teaches us to be prepared. It teaches us teamwork to be unified as the body of Christ under the same roof because our home should represent the church of God. Have great faith to be a household that is fit to have Jesus enter the door happily welcomed rather than everyone rushing to clean. Show your faith in the gratitude behind your actions because through this you will win the world. And then my last part is make it a goal to start a sister's household if you're not part of one. Make sure it has a great household name to be inspired and connected with and become part of or become part of a household within this new year. Through this, we will grow God's kingdom and his church to new heights. Thank you guys so much for letting me share. Come on, Mariah. Wow, amazing. Yeah, that was awesome. Woo! Let's go, Lynette. Come on, Lynette. Come on, Lynette. Yes. Let's go, sis. Come on, sister. Come on, Lynette. No, we can't hear you. Donna, can you unmute? Okay, can there you go. Unmute, unmute again. I pressed the ask. Uh, unmute. To me. We can hear you. you. Amen. Well, hello, ladies. Little technical difficulties, but my name is Lynette Ibarra, and today I'm going to talk about faith to love the lost. So we know as Christians, as disciples of Jesus, that we're called to love the lost. In fact, Jesus says that we need to love our enemies and pray for them. It's a command. So why do we need faith to love the lost? Because it's hard, right? Sometimes it's hard to love the people that we love. By nature, we're not patient, we're not kind. We're jealous, we're envious, we're boastful, we're proud. And a lot of times we just want things done our way, right? So, and how many, and it's impossible to love others the way that God loves us, honestly. And how many times do we get disappointed when we put our hearts out there to love the lost yeah. and they don't respond? Or, they do respond, but it takes a lot more out of us than we thought that we could give. And we start to lose heart. We start to lose faith. And we tell ourselves, I just need to love more. I need to love, love, love more. And that's why we need faith to love the lost. So where do we get that faith to love the lost? God always gives us a way, uh, makes a way for us to obey his commands. And in Romans 5, 5, and the oh, NLT, it says, and this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us, because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. God's love is expressed through the Holy Spirit in us. God's love transforms us. It changes us from the inside out. And yeah. our faith, your faith, yeah, I love the love is it freaking it will, your love, um, your faith to love the lost will grow when you understand how much God loves you. And when you're focused on not just like, I need to love more, love, love, love. And yes, we do. But when we're focused on God's love, when we're, when we're studying out God's word, when we're walking with God and um, studying out his word and God, sorry, guys, um, but we need to focus. 
And we need to have deep, vulnerable prayers with God. And that's where our faith for the lost comes from. But now we know that faith without action is dead, right? So how do we put that faith into action to love the lost? Well, what did Jesus do? What did he tell his disciples to do? In Matthew 9, when Jesus goes to town to town, it says that he's filled with compassion for the people because they were helpless. He healed them. He loved them. He saw them as lost, like sheep without a shepherd. Then in the next chapter, in Matthew 10, he tells his disciples when he sends them out, go to the lost sheep. Freely you have received, freely give. Ladies, we have been given too much to do nothing. We should feel a holy pressure inside of ourselves to share the love we've been given freely. And we know that, but yet we can still find ourselves saying, yeah, but I can't love like Jesus. Jesus loves everyone. And in the back of our minds, we can justify our lack of love for the lost. You know, but it's interesting throughout the gospels, Jesus' disciples, they, they imitated him. They expected that they can do what Jesus did. Like the disciples tried to uh, cast out a demon of this boy and they couldn't. And they're like, Jesus, why can't we cast out the demon? And Peter, when he's walking on the water and he sinks, not once did Jesus say, well, of course you can't do that. You're not Jesus. I'm Jesus. You're not. What are you thinking? No, Jesus always replied, ye of little faith. You know, God's love is freely given to us and he expects us. It's expected for us to freely give that love to others. And Jesus didn't just go around telling everyone like how much he loved them. Ultimately, he died on the cross um, for our sins so that we could be saved. And we show our love to the lost by sharing our faith. God, you know, we share the truth so that they can be saved. And Jesus prayed in the garden of Gethsemane three times. God, is there any other way? That's how I feel sometimes. Like when I go to share my faith, like, God, is there any other way? It can be hard, right? But Jesus said, not as I will, but your will be done. And Jesus, when he prayed, Jesus sweated blood when he prayed about sharing his faith. And that's what he did when he went to the cross. He had the faith to do the will of God. Through love, he shared his faith. He made a way for you to be saved. And that happens when we share our faith. It's loving the lost. It's giving people the opportunity to come in contact with the blood of Christ. So we need to put our love into action and share faith. Make it into Bible study. Share the word of God so that their whole lives can be changed from the inside out. So... Why do we need faith to love the lost? Because we can't do it on our own. Where do we get that faith to love the lost? From God, focusing on God's love. And how do we put that love, that faith, into action to love the lost? Sharing your faith, sharing the truth from the scriptures, just like somebody did with you. Sisters, in 2000, yeah, 2021, let's have mountain-moving faith to love the lost. I love you guys so much. Thank you. Great job. Oh, that was amazing. That was awesome. Thank Thank you, Vamos, Sonia. Vamos, Sonia. Good morning, my sisters. My name is Sonia Gonzalez. My husband and I lead the Spanish region. I am so honored and grateful to share with you this. Uh, the title I got is Faith to be Generous. So please read with me Mark 12, 41. Jesus sat down opposite to the place where the offerings were, were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in a large amounts, but the poor widow came and put into the treasury small copper coins, worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples, Jesus uh, calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put everything she had to live on. Uh, let's read also Acts 2.45. They sold pro property and possessions 
to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So first, we're going to talk about the widow. Sisters, do you think you don't have nothing? Well, look at the poor widow. She had only two cents, probably. And she gave them all. What about uh, you? Come on, Sonia. We need to also think like, you know, uh, like the widow. Have a lot of faith that God is going to take care of us. You know, I remember when uh, we became disciples. We were, we had 10 kids. But my husband and I always gave. I remember the first uh, contr first contribution, special missions. We sold everything in our home and we gave to special missions. And also I remember uh, when we planned, uh, when we were in Oregon and we came to plant the church here, we raised through in that year, three times the special contributions we gave. So if you feel your poor, think on the widow, the faith that she had to give to God. And I really want to encourage you to, to be generous like her. You know, a lot of us have a lot of stuff that we can sell. You know, for me, um, when I uh, run out of stuff to sell, I, 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 I start baking, you know, I bake tamales, I bake cookies, I bake, um, I bake these breads, you know, these loaf breads. Uh, last year, one sister, uh, she goes, oh, that smells delicious. And she took a, she got me one and she took a bite and says, they're so good. They're so delicious. She goes, how much are they? And I say, $8. She goes, what? And I said, well, look at Starbucks. You know, Starbucks, they sell you a very small piece for three or three, four dollars, you know? So $8 is not that much. So this year I sold, I sold them again for $10, you know? And uh, but I, I want to encourage you, my sisters, to do something, to have the fate of the widow, to, to, to use your hands. You know, you, I know some of you have a lot of stuff that you don't use that you could sell or good stuff that you could sell or do something to, 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 to give to the kingdom, to give to God so we can plant more churches. I am so encouraged, you know, also we see the difference in the other um disciples in the first century they have possessions they sold their homes they sell land they to give to everybody also you know i remember when we didn't have uh when we wanted to give more we always sold our car but god always gave us a better car you know and, and you have to have the faith that you give to god he's always gonna return back to you so i want to encourage you my sisters to really really have that faith of this widow that uh, gave everything she had. And the first century disciples that they gave, they sold their possessions and gave to the poor and needy. And we really can make the difference, my sisters. I am so encouraged by my husband because he always, always uh, gives our contribution, no matter what, if they cut the electricity, they cut the gas, whatever. But, you know, we always give our special. And uh, well, I'm so grateful to share with you God, God, how God has blessed us. Love you, my sisters. Have an incredible rest of the day. Vamos, Sonia. That was awesome, sis. Thank you. Gracias. Well, hello, everyone. It's so good to see your faces. Um, I looked at the participant count, and there's over 300 women here today. I am just so encouraged. I'm grateful to be with you. Um, my name is Elizabeth McDonald. I have the privilege to serve the Al Alpha Omega Super Region. Um, I'm married to an awesome husband. His name's Richie. I have four little kiddos. And today I've been given the title Faith to be Physically Fit. Uh, and first and foremost, I wanted to say thank you to Leanne for that just absolutely moving lesson, so inspired by her personal example and by her faith and her vulnerability. Um, okay, so to my lesson, faith to be physically fit. Okay, so I could do like a whole lesson about this. It is such a deep conviction of mine. It's a huge area of personal growth, but I have five minutes, so we won't go into it too much. 
Uh, but instead, I'm going to do some storytelling and then share my convictions with you guys and then give a few practicals. So if you'd like to turn over to Proverbs 31 while I share my story, please do so. Um, for me, okay, so my, my relationship with fitness is kind of funny because I grew up a very artsy child. I am not athletic. I um, read books and crafted and um, I joined track in middle school, but I faked injuries every week so I didn't have to run. They made me the shot put girl because I couldn't actually get down like the 50 meter dash. Um, um, I did performing arts in high school, art club, national art stuff. Like I did a performing art called Color Guard that is very physical, but I didn't like work out or anything. Um, so I've never been physically, <laughs> physically fit. Um, when I went to college, I started working out one and a half hours a day because I was so bored out of my mind. I wasn't a disciple yet for the first semester. So I just worked out at the gym. I had no idea what I was doing. I was just there to kill time, uh, but then I became a disciple and I had purpose and I had things to do and I just stopped working out. Uh, I didn't start working out, out again for five years uh, until after I'd had my first baby. You At a six week checkup, you, your doctor tells you, okay, it's time for you, you can work out again. So I decided to go for a run. I'd never run. And so I went for a run and I injured myself. <laughs> so I stopped. Um, I didn't start working out again until after my third baby. Um, Cause I was like, oh, I've had so many kids. I should work out. And it went okay. Uh, I started, I got introduced into more things, but it wasn't great. Uh, it wasn't until after my fourth baby, um, she just turned a year a little bit ago that I really started getting into physical fitness. But it, a lot had to change in my heart to get there. Um, it, you know, it's been an on again, off again relationship with fitness, but, uh, I had seen my body do so many great things that I really felt it was time to get in touch with, um, uh, my fitness and in touch with what was going on inside my heart. Uh, I went from a postpartum at home guide to a workout app to now I do CrossFit three to four times a week and I love it. It's so great. Uh, but I've had, I've struggled having faith with this, um, to become physically fit because I've been so weak, because I was, my body was injured from having children. Um, I have a lot of kids. I don't have extra spare time. I have to find time. I don't have spare time. Um, you know, I have all these things stacked against me when it comes to physical fitness, but this scripture that I want to read has really helped my heart in this area to have faith to be physically fit. And in Proverbs 31, a lot of us are well versed with um, who this is, but this is an epilogue, the wife of a noble character. And it goes on to describe this woman who is just excellent at so many things. Um, like in verse 10, it says, a wife of noble character who can find she is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. And go down to verse 17, it says, she sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. Down verse 30, it says, charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And I love that. In verse 17, it says, her arms are strong for her tasks. Uh, all the translations translate it to physical strength. She had strong arms. She can make it happen. She could pick up stuff. You can think back then, they didn't have workout classes. They didn't have CrossFit. They didn't have jazzercise. They didn't have Zumba. They just had to be physically fit to do their life. And, and I love that it um, points this out in this whole passage because physical fitness really is, just like this scripture describes, it's just a part of our life overall. And when we are physically fit, we can do our other tasks even better. Um, you know, it allowed her to carry about her tasks. So for me, when I repented from my focus on aesthetics, because Honestly, I, I started running and working out after having kids because my body had changed so much. It was weird and lumpy and soft and gooey. And uh, I, was, I was really mourning how my body had changed. And I had was so focused on how I looked and what weight I was. And every time I hopped on the scale, I cried. Um, I cry a lot and um, just in general, but definitely with the scale. And so I was so focused on the wrong things when that was never God's heart. God's heart was that, you know, that we could have this the strong arms, our strong bodies, so we can do the tasks that he's given us. So there was a lot of repentance I had to do. I had to realize that spiritual growth, the spiritual growth I could have 
through this and how being physically fit served greater needs. I got to a point where I couldn't even pick up my, my oldest daughter. She's a big girl. Uh, I couldn't pick her up and it, I cried. I was like, why, why am I, why can't I do this? Why can't I serve her in this way? Um, and so I became more eager, all the more eager to have great faith in this area. The spiritual lessons that it's taught me, one is humility. Oh my gosh, I cry often when I'm working out. It's really embarrassing. Right now I'm in this class, socially distanced, we're really far away from each other. But I cry and there's all these men in class and I'm just like, excuse me, I just need to take a minute. Because it's hard. It is hard work. Um, it's taught me a lot of humility. After having kids, I couldn't do simple things like a plank or anything like that. I would just sit there and cry, um, but it helps me to be humble. It's okay. There are times where I'm weak and that's okay. And how that's amazing so much, how it transcends spiritually. There are times when we are weak spiritually, weak emotionally, and that's okay. As long as we continue to move forward towards God through it, through it. Uh, it's taught me perseverance to not give up. I hate it. I hate like, like the last one third of a workout. I'm like, I'm done. I'm done. I could go home. I'm fine. But I have to persevere, go further than I want to. And that's taught me some great spiritual perseverance. It's taught me patience with myself because um, things don't happen overnight. Have you ever like tried to do one workout and you're like, I think I have abs now, right? Wrong. Doesn't work like that. <laughs> so it's patience with, you know, progress, uh, uh, little increments of progress over time, pushing myself as hard as I can. I think uh, I used to do workouts that were like on YouTube for 10 minutes and like feel good about myself. And those are good. That's way better than sitting on, on the couch, but it didn't push me. It didn't like cause me to cry. It didn't really push my limits. Um, so really having to push myself now. And then also the maturity to take care of myself. I am not a spring chicken anymore. I've had four kids. I've hit 30. Um, I need to be more well-rounded. Uh, so it's taught me all those things. So for you ladies today, I wanted to give you some practicals. Number one, and find something that works. Anything. I don't really care what it is. Walking, brisk walking, at home workouts, um, guides, CrossFit classes, as long as they're COVID safe and things like that. Like, I, you know, find something that you thoroughly enjoy that pushes you that you can incorporate consistently forever. We're not doing New Year's resolutions of working out once, you know, just for January, but forever. Uh, be ready. To say, okay, so that's first one. Second one. Be ready for it to expose you. Ask God in your quiet times, please expose the spiritual weaknesses in my heart through working out. Because it does. Because working out challenges us and it doesn't really care. There's no moral value to one push-up or doing 10 push-ups. There's no good or bad. It just is. But it challenges our uh, the moral value we place on them and exposes our priorities and our hangups. Like for example, I can, I can pick up a lot of weight off the ground but I can't, I can't do a pull up. I can't even, I can't even try to move an inch forward. Like it's, it's a big deal. So, um, that's just me sharing. Uh, anyways. And then third is, uh, the practical is to heal your view of your body and to work out because you love what God has given you instead of because you hate your body. And this was the biggest mind repentance, uh, or repentance I needed in my heart and in my brain to be able to work out consistently. I had to work out because I loved what God had given me, that I was able-bodied. I was grateful. I was able to bear four children. I'm still moving and talking and can work and preach and serve and cook and clean. And because of that, I want to make it even better what God has given me, not because I hate my body. So to close out, I want to give you some zinger quotes. Um, zinger is like zing, shing, like that. Anyways, um, okay, your body doesn't have a soul. Your soul has a body. Uh, you're not defined by your body or your appearance, but take care of it because it houses your soul. And then the last one is your body is a tool, not a museum, especially for all those moms. Your body is a tool, not a museum. So let's use our bodies for what God intended, serving him and serving others and not trying to preserve some aesthetic of youth. And so my challenge for you ladies is to have great faith to be physically fit this year and to glorify God in this area. Thank you so much for listening. Elizabeth. Amazing. That was amazing. Elizabeth, come on. That was amazing. Wow, great. <laughs> Amen. Wow. Oh my goodness. That was so incredible. Sisters, I don't know about you, 
but I feel super blessed this afternoon. I feel super spoiled. I think all of these women are honestly like spiritual Avengers, okay? I'm gonna tell you that we are all superheroes in the kingdom of God, and today we've been given an incredible treat. And I just want to say thank you, Joali, for being an incredible MC today. We so appreciate your servitude. Leanne, oh my goodness, Leanne, you have hit all of our soft spots. Thank you so much for your example. Um, I so appreciate your guidance today to just take the covers off and look at the grieving process step by step in the physical sense and the spiritual sense. And I just so appreciate this time talking about grief because it's almost as if we need to be able to give ourselves the permission to do that. And I think Leanne, your sermon today was just a sermon for a lifetime. Grieving is something that we will need to, to deal with and learn how to, to use in our life for the rest of our lives. So thank you, Leanne. As well, we are praying for your family. We're so grateful for all that you do for the kingdom. And of course, the rest of the women this, this morning, um, thank you so much to Mariah, Luz, Marlo, Lauren, April Baker, Jesse, um, Lynette, Sonia, and Elizabeth McDonald for your incredible charges this morning. Um, today, I think I was really impacted by the concept of relationships, the concept of asking myself, what can I do to give and not just take? I was so convicted by Joali's lesson and um, her description of the fact that it's going to take faith and humility to just really entrust ourselves to other people. I love that um, she was super relatable. Um, it, it takes great soul diving, you know, taking the moment to actually reflect into our own lives and see what it's going to take for us. And I think that's me. I know I for sure need to grow in my faith to be able to entrust myself to other people. And this year, I've actually made a decision to really go after being more adventurous, go, really go after being more giving, just having fun. And, and I think the practical, like I said, is what am I going to do to give in all of my relationships more than I have been giving? Because it's, it's one thing to, to teach, it's one thing to lead, but it's another thing to give in thoughtfulness. And I wanna grow in that. And so thank you, Joali and all the women for really inspiring us. Um, I'm super convicted, so, so grateful for the powerful uh, lessons that we've been given. And you know, the vision is let's apply all the wisdom we've been given today so that we can win the world and be a light. That's the vision. Mariah Lasher said in her short charge, the vision is to win the world and be a light. And I'm so excited about the Women's Day coming up. It's gonna be a great opportunity for us to really live this out and be all about our purpose. So ladies, that is our session for today. Why don't we bow our heads in prayer and I'll go ahead and pray us out. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so, so much for all the juicy lessons that we've been given today, God. Um, thank you so much for being able to just give us the, the heart-wrenching things, the moments. God, you know exactly what we need in order for us to learn these lessons and to be able to connect to everything that has been spoken to us today, God. I pray that, God, we can be women of faith and deep humility. We pray to please you, God. We pray to honor you with everything that we have, God. We are so undeserving, but we're so grateful, God. I pray that we can learn to really be a team um, in the kingdom, in the women's ministry here, especially in the LA church, as this is where we are at. And I pray so much that you bless all of our hearts. Help us to really have a mountain moving 2021. I love you so much, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love you, ladies. You are all dismissed. Thank you so much for Thank joining you, us today. Thank you. I love you. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome.